So hello and welcome to today's webinar titled SMO2 as an indicator of physical strain during high intensity power training. And this is presented by Jacob Olthoff. Uh, we'll get started with the presentation here in, in uh, just a minute or two. Uh, just a few comments on the format for today. The presentation time is approximately 30 minutes. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions at the, uh, at the halfway point, and then we'll have uh, a longer Q&A session at the end. Please type your questions uh, in the Q&A panel on your screen and note that this is different than the chat panel. So there's a, there's a separate uh, panel to type your questions in, and that's where we'll be taking the questions from. If we run out of time for questions, we will post Jacob's answers to any remaining questions on our forum page, and we'll send out a link uh, to the forum page after the, uh, after the completion of the webinar. We're gonna aim to finish up at about 45 to 50 minutes past the hour. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and again, we'll email attendees with a link to our forum page where that re recording is posted and any, any remaining questions are answered. So our presenter today is Jacob Olthoff. Jacob is a health fitness specialist at Exos, which is associated with uh, Adidas in Germany. He's enrolled in the International Master Performance Analysis of Sports program, which is spread over three universities throughout Europe. He has a licensed degree in sports nutrition, and he has a sports science degree. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob uh, to start the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor. Um, I hope you can all hear me, guys. I will start uh, the presentation right now. All right. I hope you can see it. Yes, it's, it's coming through just fine. Perfect. All right, Dan, once again, also from me, welcome to today's uh, webinar. By the way, I added my contact information uh, to that slide, so bottom left, you can see it. Um, yeah, so now let's begin talking about uh, MOXI and muscle oxygen saturation, respectively, and their benefits for competitive fitness, focusing on basically two subtopics. Firstly, it's indication of internal load, muscle oxygen saturation versus heart rate. And secondly, it is design of workout strategies through muscle oxygen saturation, which basically builds up on the first subtopic. But before diving deeper uh, into this, some theoretical background regarding the two fundamentals here. So the first fundamental is muscle oxygen saturation, SMO2 itself. I will try to keep this relatively short and compact. So with MOXIE, we have a device using the technology of near-infrared spectroscopy, NIRS, that allows us to detect oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin and myoglobin in order to deter and tissue of a specific muscle. All right, um, the second fundamental is competitive fitness. So scientifically, it can be described as high intensity power training, HIPT, that differs from traditional high intensity interval training like a Tabata where you have 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, in that it includes a lack of that prescribed rest period. Um, and then, as a matter of fact, we have CrossFit as the sport that um, yeah, made this style of training, that, that, that style of training popular. Um, CrossFit is one of the, uh, I just see myself and not the slide. Here we go. It's one of the fastest growing modes of high intensity, uh, high intensity functional training. Um, it generally includes Olympic lifting, power lifting and gymnastic movements. And uh, still concerning CrossFit specifically, there is uh, still a big lack of uh, research. So uh, evidence at low risk of bias is sparse. 
as a result, these findings of that uh, article I'm, I'm citing here neither firmly establish the benefits or risks of CrossFit nor provide definitive practical recommendations concerning CrossFit training. Um, all right. Um, so now the first subtopic after having clarified all this, the, in the indication of internal load, muscle oxygen saturation versus heart rate. Now, this is the research I conducted during my master's program in Portugal at the University of uh, Villarreal um, with the title, um, The Effect of Official CrossFit Workouts on Temporal Relations of Physiological Changes, a pilot study on the onset and offset of muscle oxygen saturation and heart rate, which later also was accepted for the upcoming European Congress uh, of Sports Science uh, this year in October. At this point, uh, a brief but massive thank you to Katerina Abrantes and her colleague Isabel Machado. Maybe you are watching this right now here. So thank you very much. And my fellow student researcher and uh, friend from India, Swachanda Kerr. So I'm presenting this here right now, but without those guys, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this this uh, study wouldn't even wouldn't even exist. All right, now the rationale behind my research. So to this day, heart rate, HR, often is the predominant measurement to observe and plan internal load and structure workouts. So since 1980, I think uh, we have something like trim training impulse and all its later modifications over the year to assess internal load after a session. We have something like heart rate zones to uh, stick to a certain intensity without, within our session. We have a functional threshold power usually used by cyclists. Um, and then we have kind of heart rate HR derivations like resting heart rate heart rate variability and so on and i'm not saying uh please don't get me wrong that this is all bad or useless uh myself i'm, I'm having a strap around my wrist here which is using uh, heart rate variability uh however let's have a look at this so this is real heart rate data of me cycling in competing in a race 90 minutes high effort however uh, like changing workload, okay, due to uh, uphill followed by downhill and so on. I think at the end it was kind of 600 meters in height. So what I want to say is I definitely did not feel the same uh, level of exhaustion throughout the entire race. But maximal heart rate, 186, pretty close to my average heart rate, 161. So looking at HR, how much variance is captured in the data? Um, how much data is captured by heart rate if all this data is so close to the average? The question is, how sensitive is heart rate to physiological changes in the athlete under physical effort, under physical strain? And how fast is heart rate's response? So looking at the graph again, heart rate basically increased at the onset of the race, stayed high and decreased at offset. Luckily, we have some researchers looking at such things with higher scientific standards than what I was showing uh, here. So what they did is they let people run in hilly terrain and found heart rate did not really change. VO2 max, however, was high running uphill, so higher effort, and lower running downhill where participants kind of could recover. And VO2 max, uh, like the gold standard of all measurements kind of, was inversely correlated with uh, tissue saturation index. So basically what we would call muscle oxygen saturation. So those researchers concluded the hilly terrain caused a continuously changing workload. The changes were not reflected by the heart rate. Near infrared spectroscopy, so muscle oxygen saturation, could provide an alternative to monitor the running when workload continuously changes. The question now is where else do we have continuously changing workloads? 
And the answer is, of course, competitive fitness. Therefore, the aim of my study from Portugal that I was alluding to before was the examination of the onset and offset of the muscle oxygen saturation and heart rate during three different official CrossFit workouts. Hypothesis was the main hypothesis. Muscle oxygen saturation and heart rate differ significantly in the course of both their onset as well as offset. All right, respective methods. Um, it was a case study. So the participant was CrossFit athlete and coach. Um, the most important thing is he was experienced and well-trained enough to um, do the following. So what he did is the workout 19.1 part of um, the CrossFit Open, the qualifiers for the CrossFit Games, where he had uh, an AMRAP of 15 minutes of 19 wall balls and 19 calories uh, rowing. All right, then one week later, our participant did 19.3. So run one, one round for time of those movements you see right here. So 200 feet dumbbell overhead lunges, right into 50 dumbbell box step ups. And then 50 straight handstand push ups, followed by 200 feet handstand walk. Um, there was a time cap of 10 minutes. Our participant uh, made it through the dumbbell box step ups and he did a few more straight handstand push ups, just for your information. Uh, might be interesting because those uh, handstand push ups and handstand walk are not really like quad dominant. Uh, not at all, actually. All right. And again, one week later, our participant did 19.5, where we had a ladder from 33 repetitions down to nine repetitions, uh, four time of thrusters and chest to bar pull ups um, back and forth. All right. So then the muscle observed for muscle oxygen saturation with MOXIE in that, uh, in that very study was the vastus lateralis. Um, with its main function of knee extension, that was definitely needed um, within those workouts. Beside of that, of course, uh, heart rate was, was captured. We now come to results and discussion. So first, we look at uh, those absolute values in the form of trend lines. As an example, um, we have workout 19.5 here, um, shown as the onset. So the first two minutes of the workout, heart rate in beats per minute, um, muscle oxygen saturation in percent. Now, what I did is, I worked with average values from the right and the left leg that you can see uh, top right, like the top right graph. What was absolutely reasonable um, comparing those SMO2 developments, those graphs um, in each leg that you can see bottom left and the bottom right. All right, um, generally looking at the slope coefficient. So I will use uh, quickly, the laser pointer here, so slope coefficients, this number here, this number here, what we can see, very general uh, aspect is, so uh, SMO2 was decreasing, we have a negative number, a negative slope coefficient here, and the positive slope coefficient here for heart rate, so heart rate was increasing during those first two minutes of the workout. Um, then, first really remarkable aspect, is looking at the intercepts. So the number we have here, uh, we can say the participants started with a highly increased heart rate. So according to that equation, if time x is zero, he started with, it was actually a bit low, but according to that equation, that trend line, he started with a heart rate of 141 beep beats per minute. So what we can say is just too many influencing factors on heart rate. Maybe he was nervous, we just don't know. Okay. 
Now, next slide here, same graphs, but now it's the offset. So two minutes after the end of 19.5. What we can see is uh, muscle oxidant saturation supercompensation, while heart rate doesn't get completely back to its initial value that was highly increased already itself. Okay, here we have the, the supercompensation uh, of SMO2, heart rate doesn't even come back. So we can say SMO2 is reacting much quicker, okay? All right, um, now it gets a bit more complicated, okay? We observed the per percentage changes of heart rate and SMO2 during onset and offset two. So what we did for this is we converted beats per minute changes and SMO2 changes to percentage changes. How that looked like was um, every 10 seconds of onset and offset uh, of onset and offset of each workout. Here we again have 19.5 as the example. Um, so every 10 second change was eventually uh, divided by both a general and workout specific heart rate and SMO2 reserve, just to be as accurate as possible, as specific as possible. To double check, basically, we use those both reserves. Um, all right. So first step from here then was the analysis of differences between means of heart rate and muscle oxygen saturation. The result was no matter which workout, no matter if onset or offset, no matter if based on general or workout specific reserve, there were no significant differences between means of heart rate and SMO2 during onset as well as offset regarding, regarding means. And then Swachanda that uh, I mentioned before and his like statistic skills came into play and kind of saved the study for me and us. So he said, man, check the variances too. Check how far the data is spread around each mean. So if you're not that much into statistic, like I am not too much into statistics and I really needed Swachanda, the idea was check if we have the data curve is it like more spiky or is it is it is it wide okay so is the data spread around that mean is it more narrow or more wide wider okay so that was the idea for checking the variances that's what we did and that's what we found in almost all cases we had significant differences between variances of heart rate and vastus lateralis muscle oxygen saturation regarding their percentage changes, okay? Which means we had those significant differences, which means that SMO2 captures more data and can be interpreted like SMO2 is more sensitive for changes within an athlete. To wrap this up, Next year's IMPA student, uh, her name is Shivile from uh, Lithuania, continued working with my data and kindly shared those graphs with me. And what we see here is basically um, what we saw in my cycling race. But now we also have muscle oxygen saturation as a second parameter for the same workout, for the same workload, actually. And we can see it gives us much more insight what is actually going on in the athlete um, while he is under um, physical strain. This is the study I conducted in Portugal. Based on this, the question now is how to further capitalize on these findings. Um, Roger, short question, maybe if we already got some questions uh, into the Q&A box, maybe we should stop here. This is approximately the halfway point. Um, okay, yeah, that would be great. Um, uh, so one question, uh, do you need to use left and right leg both or is, is uh, measuring on one leg uh, sufficient? Okay, so that, that's, that's basically what, what I, so we measured both, 
um, we saw regarding those trend lines I showed uh, in the graphs that it was absolutely reasonable to, to take an, an average of those left and right leg and to work with that average, also use that average for our further statistical uh, analysis. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a reminder, uh, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and um, uh, submit them. Oh, we've got one more here. The, the spread in SMO2 looks larger during the lower saturations. Can you comment on why this might be? So this question probably refers to, I'm not really sure what, what, what this question is referring to, like uh, this graph here. I think the one you're, the one you're showing in, on the screen right now, there's more, there's more noise at the low SMO2 than there is at the higher. Yeah, then that's, they responded, yes, that, that, that's the plot. Okay, um, so good question actually. Um, we definitely so that, that that was that was quite a strenuous workout 19.5 as we can see though so there was some load on the athlete the interesting thing is is though that we also we, we still like have that recovery of the muscle oxygen saturation so here we can actually see or we we just get more information here was at least in terms of or regarding his like uh quad muscle is in that specific case, the vastus lateralis, here is some sort of um, recovery happening. Um, so, so those peaks we have here, it's, it's, it's clear that we have um, a big amount of lower saturation levels down here because this guy was working out. Um, but the interesting things are those recoveries here. Um, and this, why this was, this uh, is, is a good question. So we didn't, um, simultaneously captured the data and filmed the workout, this would be a next step to see what actually happened uh, during that phase of, of SMO2 recovery. Did that, did that make sense? Or do you think that answered the question? I'm not really sure. Yeah, I, I think you're getting at it. Uh, there's another comment here from another, uh, another attendee. The spread would usually be considered noise and unusable signal, uh, hence the necessity to filter NIRS data. Uh, not giving uh, better physiologic insight compared to the HR, and I, I think I would agree with that statement. Is the uh, and it's it's similar to what you said. Those those two peaks are clearly physiologically relevant. You know, something was going on during those two peaks, but then the noise at the low level is uh, is probably uh, probably not as relevant. And I'd say that's not that's not necessarily typical that we see that more noise at lower SMO2. We do see it on some athletes and not others just in general. Um, it depends on the sensor placement. Uh, and uh, um, I guess that, that's probably the main, the main factor, but uh, often we do get cleaner signals. And I'm guessing you were using the higher speed update rate in this, in this mode. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, um, that is another factor in this data is that this data was used yeah, it looks like the two hertz update rate was used, and uh, normally the, the the default update rate of the sensor is half a hertz, which would clean up a lot of that noise as well. Okay, I see. So the the, the technological part is yours. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, if there's other questions, uh, please type them in, and we'll have a we'll have a longer Q and A session uh, at the end. So uh, why don't you go ahead and and uh, continue on with the presentation? All right. Okay, we stopped here. So that was basically um, the, the 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 study from Portugal um, is was shown. Um, the main result is that we just get more insights um, about what's going on in the athlete using SMO2 compared to heart rate. Now the question is how to further capitalize on these findings in competitive fitness or CrossFit or whatever you want to call it, and with muscle oxygen saturation and MOXIE respectively. So yes, training, analysis, planning and controlling, but that's like not really accurate. Like every, that, that could mean everything. So the specific idea is using MOXIE in competitive fitness um, by means of that, developing specific workout strategies. So now we're coming uh, to 
the second subtopic, design of workout strategies through muscle oxygen saturation. This is um, the methodology, uh, like an outline, a draft, um, like the methodology for my master thesis. We basically have four measurements, um, three measurements, one familiarization. So familiarization, first measurement, second measurement, third measurement. The familiarization we skip. Um, so what's going on in the first measurement? What's the idea? The idea is to perform or to let our participants perform an AMRAP of eight minutes. So as many repetitions as possible in eight minutes of wall balls. For wall balls, we have a standardized weight. We have a target height, uh, similar to what we saw in workout 19.1. Um, and then in that first measurement, per, uh, measurement participants would go according to a self-determined pattern. So they just go as hard as they can. They take their, their, their breaks when they feel like they need them. So that's completely a self-determined pattern. We just start the timer. Uh, let them do their thing um, and they drop the weight when they feel like they, they, they want to drop it, they need to drop it and they pick it up again when they feel like, okay, I can go on um, like according to the style of a high intensity power training where you don't have a prescribed rest period. What we do is we capture muscle oxygen saturation and the instances, the moments of drops and pickups of that wall ball. Sorry. Um, we also track the repetitions completed and the invalid reps. So, for example, when they don't hit the target height. What we also do is, um, based on a counter movement uh, jump performance protocol, um, we, we, we want to analyze their fatigue. So, they basically perform uh, a counter movement jump before the AMRAP and afterwards, and then we we can find out um, how their fatigue level is. In the second measurement, everything stays the same. Everything you saw here stays the same, except for the underlying self-determined pattern. So what happens now in the second measurement is the self-determined pattern becomes a drop resaturate pattern. Uh, we call it like this, it's oriented towards the desaturate, resaturate training protocol by Moxie Academy. Um, so the difference here is uh, we just want to manipulate the rest period. The work period, they again decide on their own. Um, so they, 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 they work, um, sorry, we manipulate the rest period, yes. And they, they, they go, like the work period is, they go as hard as they can till they need to drop the wall ball. But then they are only allowed to pick it up again when we tell them, okay, now you're allowed to pick it up again. So work till weight drop is still safe determined. But then the rest period is um, observed and basically prescribed by us. So we tell them now you're resaturated, now you pick up your wall ball again. We only manipulate the rest period here. In the third measurement, the this pattern becomes an what we call or what we want to call an intended drop resaturate pattern. Again, it's ori oriented towards something uh, by the Moxie Academy, the gradual desaturate pro uh, training protocol. Now we want to manipulate work and rest period. So for the work period, we want to take the average um, of their active time they had in the first measurement. So in the first measurements, maybe they went in their first set for 30 seconds, uh, then they needed to rest, and then they worked for 20 seconds in the second set. So this would be an average of 25 seconds. So this will be the average of act or the average we use to prescribe their active time, their work time here in the third measurement. Um, the rest, again, we manipulate, we control um, by resaturation. So they always have to completely resaturate um, before they are allowed to, to pick up the wall ball again. So here, work to weight drop is prescribed. They have their average of active time from the first measurement. 
and the rest till weight pickup is also prescribed. Again, we use a full resaturation. All right. Those are the references um, I used in the first part of that presentation. And other than that, thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to, to your questions. Thank you, Jacob, for the presentation. Um, if you have questions, uh, please type them into the, uh, into the panel, the Q&A panel. Um, so what, what, uh, uh, what did you find most interesting out of the data so far with the, uh, with the recovery time? Is it, did, did people have to recover? Um, did they take more time to recover when they self-selected or more time to recover when they, when they, uh, use the Moxie? Ah, okay. So, uh, the measurements haven't started yet. Um, okay. We're, we're still like, we have the methodology, um, but we haven't started the actual measurement. We also have our participants, but the measurements haven't started yet. Okay. Um, but the, the, the main idea behind that, so the idea is actually to, to close that gap between, uh, to build a bridge between theory and practice. So what you always see in, in those uh, CrossFit boxes or wherever you are is the statement like consistency is key. So that was the idea um, and to incorporate that into a scientific work where we say, okay, we have that first measurement, they will have an average work time and we're gonna use that. Like consistency is key for that third measurement. Okay, uh, we have a question here. Uh, how did you measure the CMJ and when did you measure? Okay, it hasn't happened yet again. Yep, yep. <laughs> Um, actually, that, that, that protocol, um, a colleague of mine, uh, a fellow student of mine, um, also from the German University, uh, he, he did this in Portugal with, um, with uh, basketball players with uh, great success, uh, great insights. <clears throat> and the plan is to reach out to him again and to, to, to use um, his knowledge that he already gained. Okay. Um, with a two hertz sampling frequency, do you believe you can confidently, validly uh, pick up ball drop and pick up, which are fast movements? So what 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 should? So I, I think I think I think they're asking if you can detect the uh, if you can detect when they pick up the ball or when they drop the ball just based on the SMO2 data. Okay, so the idea is not to, to track that based on the SMO2 pattern. Maybe that I didn't explain that well enough. The idea is this is uh, basically tracked um, using using the time. So we will see the timer, we will see the time. Uh, this, the, the time will be the same in the SMO2 data sheet uh, like we have in, in, in the whole workout. So we have just that instance when they drop the ball, when they pick it up again, this will be, uh, this will be our time. And then we compare this. Um, so we basically have the time um, when they drop the, the, the wall ball, the, 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 the map ball. And then we will take this time and look into the SMO2 data to, to see what happened there, how the level was at that time. Same, same for the pickup. Okay. Um, as SMO2 change, uh, oh, as SMO2 can change day to day, not always the same. How do you prescribe the training session? You te do you test each day to determine the correct intensity and time? Each day. So are you are you uh, are you going to um, are you going to retest to determine how long they should uh, how long they should continue? Uh, um, with the with the ball throws, uh, are you gonna are you gonna reset their SMO2 values based on on a daily measurement, or are you just gonna do one measurement at the beginning? The idea at the moment was to to get that sorted in the familiarization session. Um, okay. Maybe that's maybe that's a good point that we should think about again. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, very good. Are you always measuring the quads or are you, are you interested in measuring other muscles as well? Good question. So what I can say is before we chose, before we chose the wall ball as our exercise, the idea was to do a back squat. 
um, to have like a more isolated movement, just focusing on the quad, on the vastus lateralis in that case. Um, <clears throat> the problem was that it takes some time. So basically, if you need to drop the barbell, then you have to bring it back to the back rack position, right? Um, so this setup would have been much more complicated than what we have with the ball ball. Also, we would have needed something like uh, 1RM testing to determine which weight every participant should choose for a back squat. If we would have done the back squat for the ball balls, we have kind of a standardized, as I said, weight and target height that was always used uh, in those in those open workouts, for example. Um, yeah, so then the idea now is if we do wall balls to get a second sensor somewhere like uh, some some muscle groups some muscle in the upper body um, but at the moment like to keep it relatively simple um, the idea was to to focus on on the vastus lateralis um, for, for, for 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 that study yeah okay we have a comment and a question here thank you for the presentation I did a uh, research about older adults using a one-minute bilateral heel raise test. I found a few people's SMO2 still decreases but does not increase after the test during the recovery after the first minute. What could be the potential reasons for this? Oh, yeah. uh, so there was basically no super compensation uh, during recovery, if I understand correctly. Um, yeah, I, th I think. Yep, I think that's. I think that's what. Uh, I think that's where this is going. Okay. Um, to be honest, I can't answer that question. There might be. There might be different reason reasons, especially since that po population is so different than like compared to 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 the participants I'm um, I'm working with. Um, so yeah, definitely not an expert there. And uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, we got we got a few more here yet. Uh, how long does the athlete need to warm up or perform an exercise to understand their SMO2 baseline, since the baseline saturation will increase with warm up? Mm -hmm. With warm up, ah, okay. So um, one thing we did in Portugal, uh, maybe that at least answers a part of that question, is that we had. Um, a prescribed standardized warm up for all those uh, three workouts we did with the participants and then we we uh, had a 5 minute gap between where the participant was was asked to do like basically nothing between the end of the warm up um, and the start of the workout to get like um, this this uh, baseline muscle oxygen saturation level back and for muscle oxygen saturation uh, that worked for heart rate it was uh, still increased as, as I showed in, on those graphs. Okay, uh, why did you decide to choose average work time for the third measurement? I imagine it will vary a lot. Um, you know, and it gives a range of numbers and then someone else, it might be a very different range of numbers. And will you look at total work done with the different measurement protocols and perceived intensity or heart rate? Okay, so first question. Um, this, uh, as I said, so the idea, this is all like, the, 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 those are our plans, right? There, there, might, there might be things that, as it usually is in, in, in research, that just don't work as planned and then we have to adjust them again. Um, we still want to do kind of a testing with ourselves before to see um, to, to, to see if there occur any problems that we don't see at the moment. Um, uh, still, um, the, the idea behind this average work time, again, was uh, consistency is key and um, we, we needed some we, we needed some idea for prescribing the, the the active time, the work time. So using resaturation to to control the recovery time, uh, the rest time that was quite obvious, or maybe not obvious, but that was quite understandable, let's say. And um, and then the, the 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 we needed to come up with something also for the work time, and that was this or is the solution we found so far. Maybe uh, if 
if you have a better or different idea, I'm absolutely keen on on, on hearing it. Uh, yeah. Have you collected data with multiple participants or just the one? And then I'm interested to know if the data collection process has been complicated at all by body type or body fat. Uh-huh. Uh, so this, um, this uh, study from Portugal was a case study, so it was just one participant. Um, body fat was measured by Isabel Machado, the, 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 um, the professor from Portugal. Um, it was it was relatively low. That's actually all I need. I didn't include that into my in, into my study. Okay. Um, do you think that you can find someone's SMO2 threshold and use it to select when to stop exercise before that threshold is achieved? So we would let someone work out and would tell him to stop working out before the before like the the, the threshold is achieved. The, I think the, I think they're talking about the lower threshold. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, so if if that's possible or if that's reasonable or what what was the question? Um, yeah. Did this, do you think you could do that? Is what they're asking. If if the participants are willing to do that, that's that's the question. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if if they would see afterwards that their performance uh, at the end, like they that, that they complete more reps uh, in those eight minutes, um, maybe after seeing that they would, uh, yeah, they they would think about their approach, uh, or they would think about how they approach every workout. Like uh, or most of them, many of them, um, going hard at the beginning and then uh, getting slower and slower over time. Um, so yeah, that, that's something we want to find out actually. Okay. Um, given that SMO2 levels may vary, uh, entry level versus in work session level, have you found significant percentile changes between identical workouts on successive days? And might these changes correlate to forms of adaptation? That was a long question. To be honest, yeah. if I can't see it, it's really. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so. Are 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 you? Um, do you do you see differences from day to day on the same athlete in their SMO two levels? Um, to be honest, I have not enough uh, experience with that. So I worked with that one participant measured uh, muscle oxygen uh, with, with him, with myself, and actually that's it. Uh, so I can't really talk about that. Okay. Um, heart rate is not considered a valid indicator of internal load during intermittent exercise. So did you consider using RPE instead and make comparisons with SMO2? No. RPE, RPE is, uh, is something would be great if Sochanda would be here right now because he He's not a big fan of that. Um, what's for sure is that you need uh, experienced athletes um, for using RPE. And um, at the moment, especially after that study in, in, in Portugal, where I got such great, um, such great results with, with SMO2, comparing something like with, with something like heart rate that is usually used, um, I would I would stick to to. Uh, um, SMO2 and uh, yeah, RPE. We, we 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 thought about that, but um, decided not to not to include it into our studies. It would be maybe it would be maybe we could add on top of whatever we do, but we would not really rely on uh, RPE. Only, okay, at least. Okay. Um, we'll take one more question here, and then I think we're just about out of time. Uh, so with CrossFit-style exercise and high-intensity functional training in general, the hallmark is that the rest varies with a go-before-you-are-ready mindset, which promotes higher intensity than traditional exercise. Isn't studying in this manner with prescribed rest not a true representation of how CrossFit is performed? Good question. Yeah, maybe, maybe still we need to to rethink some things. And if it's about performance, um, and if we get better results with some prescription patterns instead of just go as hard as you can, 
this would be at least interesting for for top level athletes competing at or or maybe this could like over time help them to get another tool um to to train to train more efficiently uh, maybe something like someone like Brent Fikowski doesn't need to test every movement combination over and over again to find out what the perfect repetition split for him is. Maybe we can give him an equation, a tool that makes it possible to, for him to, to work more efficiently, to do a workout maybe only once and to get an idea how his perfect repetition split looks like uh, instead of like needing to go all out again and the idea uh, that maybe i forgot to say that behind doing that counter movement jump performance uh to to find out something about the the, the athlete's fatigue is that we want to transfer our findings to what would be if what was is not the only movement in the workout or if this workout is followed by another one so we want to see how fatigued the athlete is uh, after each of uh, the the prescribed or not prescribed self-determined patterns. Okay, okay, excellent. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this information with us today, uh, and and best of luck with with uh, with your master's project and and your continued work. Um, maybe we can do a follow up uh, at at some point in the future. I think that would be uh, I think that would be very well received. So, uh, thank you for sharing this information, and thank you to all of the attendees. Uh, uh, for joining us here today. Uh, again, the recording will be sent out uh, in an email, uh, and we will post this on our forum. And if, if you have a follow-up question uh, uh, after uh, uh, after the event is over, you can post that on the forum, and we'll invite uh, Jacob to participate in answering any questions on the forum as well. So uh, thank you, everyone, and, and uh, have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers.